You are listening to The Worlding Podcast, where we explore the relationship of how we are both, shaping and being shaped by our surroundings. The podcast traces interconnections by inviting each episode's guest to pass on the mic to someone who has influenced their world. And now, here's your host, dance artist Renee Schadler. Hello, friends. Today we're completing our sixth string figure with my guest, Lucy Powell, who is an environmental activist, artist, and mindfulness practitioner with a special interest in deep listening. Today we're focusing on Lucy's interest in navigating uncertainty and her recent project, Becoming Arboreal, which was a three-hour artist walk in Berlin's Tiergarten. Thanks so much for chatting with us today, Lucy. Thank you for having me. To begin our conversation around worlding and how we're shaping and being shaped by our surroundings, I'd love to hear a little bit about your world that you're currently in. What's drawing your attention right now and how is it affecting you in this moment? Do you mean in my immediate surroundings or more bigger picture? Hmm. I think I would love to start with your immediate surroundings and I would be very curious then to expand to the bigger picture and what that is for you. I mean, my immediate surroundings, I'm indoors around a lot of quite uh, jungly plants that are taking over my kind of workspace. I've got some pigeons living immediately outside the window and they sort of nested there and they uh, sort of making friends with them. <laughs> um, they're not very scared of me. It's it's an interesting uh, thing of just walking up towards them and then backing off again. And and they look at me in this very crazy, orange-eyed way. <laughs> and uh, but we're we're gradually um, becoming yeah friends friends through the through the glass. It's quite it's it's a it's a, a trust building thing. It's quite lovely actually. But I have to cr- scrape their shit off regularly as well. <laughs> Yeah. So that's the immediate surroundings. Um, larger surroundings. Um, yeah, I guess I, I mean, always the all consuming question is for me is, is, is how to be in the world as it is now, whatever that means at different times, what that means, but it, for me, it feels very urgent. There's a great sense of urgency to living now. So the question is very close up. Um, how to be in the world in, in so many different levels. And, and it's just this great ontological thing, which is in my art pro, um, practice, but it's also in the mindfulness. That's how I kind of got drawn to it, because it's such a deep study of, of that of that kind of ontological inquiry. And so for me, that those two interweave very closely. And then there's the third element of, um, well, the activist side, which I'm not kind of so fully engaged with at the moment. I'm more sort of working with this mindfulness thing at the moment as a kind of, it is kind of an activist. It is kind of a political statement, I think, or a political practice. Um, so it's those sort of three strands, the art space being this space of imagination and possibility, the um, mindfulness space of really cultivating a kind of receptivity um, and listening and an and, and attunement, which can inform then the activist practice, can inform all kinds of relational relationality all kinds of uh, and, and the art practice so it, they all kind of feed into each other the the um the activism thing I, I think is important though because that's the only way stuff really changes that's a really interesting push and pull actually between these three different roles and I definitely see how they all interplay into one another I'm interested in how you were mentioning the urgency of the bigger world. For you, is that a 
bodily urge. Obviously, we're in the midst of a global pandemic. The sixth mass extinction, is that in relation to politics? Is there a specific area in that urgency that's pulling you at the moment? I see the the problems as all pretty much interrelated, so I don't think... um, I don't think it, it, you know, this this political polarization, the um, the climate, the you know, I, and I see COVID as you know, it, it, it's it's much the pushback of the of the you know the 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 natural world if you want to want a better name and um, those two you know the lack of space there for these 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 zoonotic diseases jumping over um yeah and, and the sense of leaders not doing not taking not taking action so it's and and you know and hearing the the, the news rolling out every day and just just walking down the street just like what the experience of weather is weather is as Tim Morton, he said it ages ago. It's 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 just uncanny now. You can't you can't make a comment about the weather. Or you can't experience the sun without it um, feeling like you know it's so often unseasonably something, <laughs> mostly warm or windy or you know every it's it's sort of um, this idea of being on steroids. I think is quite a nice image for it. This this. Um, at the weekend, I was doing a kind of workshop with this. She's a climate scientist and also a Zen practitioner, Kriti Kanko. Um, and she talks about everything's on steroids now, that the, because the, the climate crisis is putting kind of everything on steroids. So it's not, you know, not causing the hurricane, but it's making the hurricane bigger. Or it's just got this, it's just this kind of buzzing in the air. And I, and I feel that. I feel that, yeah. I, I think I feel it. Yeah, I, I had this sort of. If we haven't got, a, you know, in. I describe it, you know, with my hand up on my nose and kind of like this is, this is how we're living. You know, it's it's so in your face. You know, it's um, so it's so I feel like I need to respond. I need, you know, it's this. There is this sense of overwhelm, and I think I have this sense of how to have, and the, and the overwhelm is this quite reactive space, you know, and it's like um, it's how to be responsive rather than reactive, and that's the that's the work on all kinds of levels. I imagine also that's how your mindfulness practice comes in because I know you're working very closely with bodily sensations and in preparation for this podcast, Lucy and I actually had a chat and we decided to bring the proposition and way of embodying the research to the forefront of the podcast at the beginning. So I wondered, Lucy, if you could talk us through your proposition for today, which I think really addresses these sensations you're talking about at the moment. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this is a a practice. It's a kind of binaural listening. So it's listening. The idea while you're listening to our voices, as we speak and and the sounds that are around you if you try and also be listening inside at the same time so you have these this inside outside this binaural listening so um just to guide you into this and then the invitation is to try and maintain this in some way throughout the rest of our the conversation So good to start in a kind of classical way of um, feeling contact points with the ground or a chair or with your on a, with your legs or your hands on a surface. So really feeling into those contact into the contact between your, your own body and the body bodies around you or underneath you. And putting your awareness there into the density of that contact and perhaps feeling how it's a kind of blurred zone. You don't really know where your body ends and the 
the, the other body that you're meeting begins and that's a kind of interesting threshold space and so just feeling into that first of all and then unfolding your awareness away from that point and those points and just expanding it into the rest of your body, so upwards and outwards and stretching your awareness to your whole body. And also a little bit beyond your body into the sort of space that's just surrounding your body. Or, so feel into that kind of again. sort of blurred space around where you don't know where you end and the outside begins. And then listening to my voice and our voices, can you feel that the voices inside your body if you're not just listening with your ears but with your whole body and then maybe you can feel different sensations there maybe it's uh, some tingling some warmth some cold maybe there's some tension in different parts of the body. I don't feel you need to change it. Just feel it. And feel how these things are not stable. They're moving around, they're shifting, they're rising up and evaporating. Or maybe they are solid, feel more solid. So just feeling into the, and maybe there's an emotional resonances there as well, or mind states or moods or tirednesses or agitations. So those sort of things, feeling those out and feeling those shift as you listen to the sounds. sounds of our voices as we continue our conversation. Thank you so much, Lucy. I'm going to extend my awareness as I chat with you about your most recent work, Becoming Arboreal, which for those that aren't familiar with this word, arboreal means to relate to or resemble a tree. Can you share with listeners who may not be familiar with Tiergarten what it is and what drew you to this very important site in Berlin? Yeah, I mean, I think it was, um, I'd, done an, I'd done a walk there before about animals and, the poli and politics and I really wanted to spend some more time there and do some more research there. It's such an interesting layered space and I love the fact that it's kind of, the heart of the city. It was what the city was before the city became a city, you know. Then it was was a private hunting ground for the for the kings or queens or whatever at the time. And then and then it was turned over into a public park. Um, and then during after World War II, it was almost so many of the trees there, I think Bar Tooth couple of thousand of them, a thousand or so, were um, uh, used for firewood. They were all cut down and used for firewood. Um, and it was just a, a muddy field, which they then used to, f to farm vegetables in. But they left the oldest trees there. 
and I like the idea to go and revisit those trees and um, to start basically the walk goes around a couple of uh, you know about five or six and spend we spend time with some of these survivor trees um, yeah I really like the idea of what you know this was during the pandemic I started doing this and, and it, you know everyone was we were all outside a lot more and it was really lovely to really spend time there through this through necessity through the research and really um, spending time uh, um, with with these individual trees and with this with the space just in general and getting to know it more and uh, yeah I, I, it was for me this idea of the tree being rooted and not being able to run away so having to meet the you know the situation this and it's done this over hundreds of years um, some of them, you know, several, several of them are several hundred years old. You know, the idea of being rooted to the spot and not being able to run away um, and having to just be with whatever comes towards you and um, spend, you know, to literally stay with the trouble because um, you can't run away. So this was for me this very powerful uh way of thinking through how to, you know, and it relates obviously to to mindfulness um, so much of like in the history, in the Buddhist history of, of, of practicing meditation is, is done with trees, around trees. That's, uh, there's a whole Thai forest tradition where they are outside in the forest. So this was, yeah, that was, that was the kind of starting point there. Mm. I'd love to share as you're talking about being a tree rooted in the ground. I also have a Vipassana practice. I'm been practicing for three years and attend regularly 10-day courses, which are daily seated practices of observing the nature within your own body through the process of bodily sensations. So it really resonates with what you're saying. And there is definitely this feeling when you're sitting there for hours and you make an aditan, so a seating of strong determination to not open your hands, to not open your eyes, to not move from your position. And it's incredible through that process, actually, this idea, as you're explaining, of impermanence is so evident in everything we do, this idea that everything is constantly changing, a process of living and dying, things arising and passing away. And I can really see that in the tree also and being rooted. I think that's a lovely parallel to really develop this ability to see things as they really are. I know in Vipassana that's the literal definition, to see things as they really are. And there is something also in COVID of not being able to move, like the pandemic kind of causing us to stay where we got stuck if it's you know flights are cancelled or you're quarantining inside your home can you talk a little bit to that like this stationary moment and what that does for our bodily sensations I mean I do practice now or have done since a few years every single morning doing that sitting for half an hour you know and I think and I feel it um, if I don't do it, I feel that much more hectic <laughs> throughout the day. I mean, I'm quite naturally quite a hectic person. Um, and, and it's this, um, I think it's what's interesting with mindfulness is it sounds like it's so much about the mind, but it's actually about your training the mind to be in the body. Um, to tether it, you know, this body, heart, mind kind of in, in one as one thing and to perceive it as such and to and to because because the mind, you know, spins off and goes on, you know, it's a narrative beast by nature and it spins off and creates all kinds of stories and they may be, you know, totally neurotic and have nothing to do, but the, the, the bringing them back into this, the body is just a very kind of... Uh, it's a very, it's a, it's a, you know, when instead of meeting like panic, it, as it, oh, like all oh, terrible things could happen, you just you feel it like what does that actually feel like in the body, and then you can calm down quite a lot easier. Um, so, so it, it just is a kind of really is a grounding thing, and and I think you know, uh, 
I, I mean, the, the COVID was a difficult thing. I think first round, obviously, everyone was had sort of hope, <laughs> was hopeful about what it could do. And, there was, and then it became, you know, uh, more and more difficult and for so many people and, you know, that kind of thing. But um, I did love and I think a lot of people love just having a bit of I mean, I'm not a parent, so it's different. And, and I understand that. But for me, just to stop the you know, rushing of stuff was such a relief. I just kind of needed some time to catch up on myself, you know, and to, um, and, and that was just so needed. At least the first, say, round one <laughs> um, of that was just a real relief and really kind of um, spoke to this need to just to slow down and just not have all this stuff going on all the time. Um, I was really grateful to that. And uh, able to kind of catch up with it, years and years of of not having done it, you know. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if that's the question. You <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely on how how the bodily sensations through being stationary create a different attention to perhaps walking through your day to day life with a certain nine to five rhythm. Yeah, certainly the audio world opened up for me a lot more. Um, you know, that, that. well, I guess, as we know, it was a le- less cars, less aeroplanes. I, I used to have, like, Tegel Airport, load of aeroplanes going over my flat regularly, you know, and then I that just stopped and suddenly... Suddenly, I heard all the all the birds, and I, you know, it was I was that just kind of, and they'd been there all the time, and suddenly, that world is so present. Uh, and then I started actually doing some recordings of these blackbirds, and I made a piece with that, and um, and then I couldn't, and then that that became so noisy for me because I was so wanting to, to record the sounds that you know at four o'clock in the morning I would wake up as soon as I started singing, <laughs> and then I was you know recording and um, and so it, it it you know that that kind of got hyper um, vigilant to, to that you know it was quite strange but, but very wonderful and uh, and also knowing then finding out that these birds are very you know that they live in that garden there and, and they never leave it that's their entire world you know um, that was just very local and and uh, you know the the 10 blackbirds or something that live there that that will stay there for their lives you know so now I you know and I hear and I could hear their their different different um different songs you know that was lovely some more cartoony than others <laughs> and how they kind of riff off each other it was um no, it, was, it, was, it was kind of amazing and that was all just that was through Covid I think yeah of, of, of just being at home much more and listening It sounds very playful, actually. There is a really nice dialogue happening. Mm. I wonder, is that like one of your strategies for navigating uncertainty, connecting with more than human cycles and more than human entities, such as the blackbirds? Yeah, yes. I mean, for sure. I think think this sense of... um, This sense of... uh, not being alone this sense of being part of um this this kind of just ongoing unfolding of life you know i think and 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 seeing yourself as in in that big trajectory um that is you know goes back since uh, two, you know, what is it, two billion years and get, we'll go forward two billion years. We're kind of in the middle of the life of this planet with, in relation to the sun, you know. So, so there's, um, and, and, and I love the idea of, you know, yeah, of, of seeing this, you know, the part of the walk, a lot of it was about this, this how much trees and the vocabulary of trees is, has has kind of informed um, our human culture so deeply. You know, it's it's you know from um, this this there's so many words. You know, the the word for um, uh, 
the, the, the Icelandic word, these old, these ancient, you know, where, where, which, which where, is where the English and the German come from. Of, I can't say the Icelandic word, but it's basically vid, and that's kind of wood, but it's also wisdom, and it's uh, wit, and it's witch. And so a lot of this kind of, um, there's a sort of sense of, of of this wisdom that comes from 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 the woods, um, from being with trees. This whole idea, the the, the the whole word book comes from the bucha, the, the 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 beech tree. So knowledge, wisdom. It's just there's a lot of uh, you know just tied up deeply in that. So um, there's a lot of um, uh, refuge you could call it. There's a lot of sort of uh, you know. That's on one level of a kind of language and, and wisdom. And then, then there's a kind of this idea of, of our ancestors, our the hominid ancestors, the, you know, we, we um, our, our hominid ancestors slept in trees, you know, and, and that was uh, we, at one point of the walk, I would get everyone to climb this tree. And, and then I talk about, um, the you, you know everyone's probably familiar with the feeling of what you you're falling on the on the cusp of falling asleep and you suddenly um feel like you're falling um and this is and then you jerk awake and this is called the the hypnic jerk and it's this um one i some researcher in the states has his theory is that this is um this connects us this is the, this connects us to the memories of us sleeping in trees and it was to stop monkeys from falling out of trees, you know? And so, and I, this, and I love this idea that every time you fall asleep, you're reminded of your deep, deep past live, you know, sleeping and living in trees. Um, so I think, yeah, that, that's, that definitely is a, is a, is a, is a way to, to stop that, you know, just sort of sense of, on, you know, to navigate that space. Mm. We've talked a lot also about the organic world, so the blackbirds, the trees, things that are living. Do you have a practice also, a way of interacting with technologies? How are you navigating that space in the uncertainty? <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, this. I think part of it is a reaction against that, um I do try and yeah it's for me it's this this question of attention um uh the mindfulness practice is really it's training your mind so that when it runs off and spins out and goes you know into its neuroses you learn to you train yourself to bring it back in all the time it's and so therefore it's um it's in this more yeah it's in the direct space of your body and then and then it's just it, yeah. So um so and the technology is is this opposite thing they're using this this it's you know that through the um basically the behaviorism of the 1950s it's like it's the rat on crack stuff that's what it's des- <laughs> designed to to make you want another shot of the crack. Um and I'm I feel a you know if we talk about an attention economy, like everything's competing for to get your attention, you know, all of these devices, they're divine, d- designed to keep you online. You know, that's why this divisive thing of, you know, angry people click more. Um, um, it's it's all kind of geared up to 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 keep that, to, to produce that, to keep your keep you on in online doing that stuff. And so I feel a. um yeah, a, a need to reclaim that. <laughs> and and so it is this attention, I, you know, for, yeah, this idea that attention is kind of the most valuable thing that you have, what you give your attention to, that's a, that's a political stance. And so for me, there is a resistance to giving it too much to those kind of worlds. Um, and, and, trying to refine it more, take control, or just be, be more a, a, attuned to where it's going. Um, yeah, that's, that's important work, I think, for me. 
That's such a nice hook that what you give your attention to is a political stance. I think a lot of us are aware of that in some way, like in our backspace, but to practice it is something else. You know, there is the seated practice which you've talked about, there's the practice of walking, there's the practice of companioning with trees. There are lots of different practices um, and, and they are always active choice. I think that's where also your activism comes in. It's also a form of activism, what we choose to give attention to, which I find really resonates. Yeah. Returning to the proposition of my body, Lucy, I have to say since you made this proposition, the arches between my feet, and I'm standing on a yoga mat actually, I have a standing desk, and underneath me is a yoga mat, which is quite soft. So that space has been, I want to say like buzzing. Like I feel like all my little skin cells are like a bit zzzz. Because <laughs> I really like that space. Also, I'm a dancer and choreographer, so I spent so long pulling up the arches of my feet. So <laughs> it's nice to remember them. It's a little homage to a past life. Um, and... Yeah, I see outside of me above my monitor screen and it's quite grey outside. So this creates inside of me a type of melancholy. I think I'm really ready for summer. Um, This is definitely a longing Mm. for a future and a time of sun, uh, which creates a little bit of sadness now. So this is more an emotional response. How are you feeling I have a a strange, what is this kind of nervous heat in the body? I can feel it kind of, it's very hot and cold at the same time. But I also, my, I think it's nice to have these spaces. I like like the fact that you talk about the arches of your feet. For me, um, it's the, 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 I love these kind of soft curved spaces like the palm of your hand these um, the nook of your elbow though these kind of soft spaces that aren't they're kind of joy at the nape of your neck um, again yes like you said the, the, the arch of the feet um, those are very kind of um, good spaces to, the, to return to I think because they're very gentle spaces also maybe even the inside the, the roof of the the mouth um, there are spaces that don't well they just don't get it's it's a it's an easy space to to kind of relax into or sense a kind of openness there um yeah feeling those some of those spaces now maybe that could be a proposition to listeners to navigate uncertainty from the roof of your mouth <laughs> it's a very <laughs> thought-provoking proposition palm of the hand is also a very soft you know it's quite nice sometimes if you you know things are feeling uh stress or you just use you use your your fingertips on your palm of your hand that's very soft you know a gentle calming (laughs) thing yeah yeah it's true. Wonderful. Thank you so much for chatting to us today and contributing to the welding research well, thank you. It's been, yeah, it's great, great series. Um, thank you very much for having me. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. That completes our sixth string figure. The next series will begin with my guest, Sigma Zacharias, who is an artist and thinker currently working with grief as a materiality. So I'd be excited to share that conversation with you and also a short reminder that tomorrow, the 10th of March, you can experience last episode's guest, Ali Bishop, in a free Moving Across Thresholds lab, so www.movingacrossthresholds.com. And there you can find information on how to participate in that hybrid format, which is a light event which is hosted in Kreuzberg, Berlin, and unfortunately now fully booked, but you can still participate online because there's an interactive format, which we would love to welcome you to. So I hope to see and connect with listeners soon and reconnect for our episode with my seventh string figure. Looking forward.
Thank you for listening to the Worlding Podcast. Gefördert durch die Beauftragte der Bundesregierung für Kultur und Medien im Programm Neustart Kultur. Hilfsprogramm des Tanzen des Dachverband Tanz Deutschland.